Hey everyone, welcome to Wildlife Inspired. I'm your host, Scott Keys. Today I've got an exciting one for you. I have been geeking out with this lens for several weeks. This is the uh, Leowa 25mm Ultra Macro. Let me tell you why I'm so excited about this one right after this. Now, if you've been following the channel, you know I'm a wildlife photographer and you probably also know I'm a little bit of a nature geek. I'm going to talk about a lens today. It is not specific to wildlife photography, but if you have an interest in nature, this could be a really, really cool lens to look at for you, but it is not specific to nature. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the lens in general, but before I do, I want to tell you how I got my hands on this. Uh, one of the things about this channel is I take a lot of pride in being unbiased and where I think there might be any bias, I put it out there. I let you know how I get my hands on all of my equipment. A lot of this I pay for. Some of it is loaned to me and, and I can give an unbiased review and then I, I return it to the vendor. In this case, this one was actually gifted to me and given to me, but not necessarily for the sake of a favorable review. So I want to put this out there. I do get offers to do product endorsements or reviews. Sometimes they even involve contracts where I have to say certain things and I don't do those. Uh, my agreement with every vendor is if you send me a product and you're that comfortable with it, we should have no problems. If you think I'm going to enjoy the product, I'll give you a review and ultimately if I love it, I'll give it a favorable recommendation. If I don't like the product, my agreement with every vendor is I don't think it's fair for me to bash a product that was sent to me for free. Uh, in writing, I'll tell them what I don't like about the product and um, I just won't make a video. So anytime you see a video, uh, be rest assured that I'm probably going to recommend this product and that's where this one falls in. I will tell you right up front, I have really, really enjoyed using this over the past month. Uh, before I get into some of them, I'm going to show you some images, but before I get into that, let me just tell you a little bit about the uh, specs for this lens. Now, I've got some space over here, so I'll put some verbiage up here. I'm not going to go through all of it. Be honest, much different than some of my wildlife lenses, specs don't really matter as much as results. And so for that, I'm actually going to show you some of the things that I've been using with this. Uh, let me just talk about these macro lenses in general and, and some of the categories. They range in focal lengths. They go down 10 to 15 millimeters all the way up to about 150. And remember with macro photography, we're talking about an object that is produced at least as big as it is in real life as it is on the sensor. So a one inch object projected onto a sensor would also be one inch. Now, typically with this, my other macro lens, this is a 100 millimeter Nikon lens. Uh, this will rep reproduce at one to one, meaning again, one inch life size, minimum focus, one inch on the sensor. What is unique about this lens is that this reproduces at two and a half to five times. So now an object that is just a 20th of an inch will appear at one inch on the sensor. We'll talk about the detail. I'm going to, again, I've got some image quality to show you. Uh, I think you're going to be pretty excited about this one. So it, most important thing about this, it's an ultra macro lens. It's going to magnify at much greater than the one-to-one -one traditional macro. I have some examples where I'm going to show you one-to-one. -one. I actually take him with this lens, the Nikkor. This is a very expensive lens, by the way, the Nikkor lens. Uh, and I'm going to show you this one. Now, before I get into images and quality, let me just talk about price and build quality because that you're not going to be able to see. Uh, this is an aluminum construction. I really like this construction, even the lens cap. It screws on and it's a nice little aluminum lens cap. You're going to notice the element, if you can see this, and I'll show you some close-ups. It's very, very small. And then it's got the traditional mount, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this mount and where it's different than some of the other lenses you're going to use. On this mount, you're going to see that it's just all aluminum. There are no electric connectors to send information to your camera body. I'll talk about that at the end because some people are going to be really used to this. I will tell you, these lenses are not built the same way a lot of traditional wildlife photographers are used to having lenses. For example, there's no autofocus. This is a 100% manual lens. You're going to adjust it by turning this, I'm going to call this a magnification, not a ring zoom. So this is more of a, a ring magnification. And as I turn this, there's a little chart on the outside that'll give me the magnification that I'm using. So two and a half at the smallest. And as I increase that, it goes to five. The really interesting thing about this is it's not like some other macro lenses. So for with, uh, with some macro lenses, I can go in close, maybe a few inches away, 
And I could also take a portrait of somebody standing 10 or 15 feet away. With this lens, it is not going to do that. This is a specific lens for a specific purpose, and that's to get high quality, really intense close-ups of small objects. So you're never going to be able to pull away several feet. Your working distance, working distance, by the way, means the end of the lens to the subject. That working distance is always going to be measured in inches, never measured in feet. So that's much different than some of the other macro lenses. So let me tell you a couple of things just up front about this that I liked. I, I really do like the build quality and I love this, this ultra macro vibe that I get from this. I like the price. On some of these, especially for me, Nikkor, they make this, by the way, Canon, Olympus, Sony, they make this in, in, for many manufacturers. Uh, for me, these lenses are going to run, a high quality Nikkor lens is going to run in the thousands, so this one's about $1,000. Uh, the great thing about this is it's 400 bucks. Now, down at the bottom, check. There, there may be discount codes available. Um, when I work with a vendor, sometimes I'm a, a, a able to get like an affiliate link or a discount code. Check the bottom because you're probably going to see a discount code available for this lens. So check the bottom. Uh, pretty excited to offer that to you. So some of the differences in these macro lenses. I told you about this Nikkor Z. It's 100 millimeters. It's got an autofocus. High quality images. Great lens. Love it. If I was, and I'll be honest, if I was recommending my first macro lens, this may not be the first macro lens that I would ever buy. It's a little finicky in some ways. Um, so first macro lens, this one, pretty easy to use. It even comes with autofocus. So if I'm struggling with manual focus, I can do that. But let me tell you this. I am really excited about this because I haven't used this macro lens in a while now. I've been using this almost exclusively because I've really been looking at details. And that's where this thing shines. Seeing things that you never knew were even there. Seeing the bumps on a bug's eye. Seeing the tiny little hairs on a flower. And I've got some examples that I'll show you this. This lens is not capable of doing it. It's just not the same. This lens is. Now, I told you it's a manual focus lens. So that takes a little getting used to. I also told you it lacks uh, electronics to send information to the body so that when you're kind of adjusting this down again manually focused but also manual aperture control if I turn this dial I'll show you some close-ups I can set the aperture that information is not going to go back to the camera so whatever aperture I'm shooting here I kind of have to remember where I shot it now for most macro photographers we might be using this in a little bit more controlled environment so you're gonna find a sweet spot in here usually between f8 and f16. This isn't a macro video, but I will tell you, as you increase the aperture, requires more light, you get more depth of field, which can be a problem with these, these ultra macro lenses. You will also introduce a concept of diffraction, and to make it simple, I'll just say, as you increase in diffraction, there's a slight decrease in image quality, very, very slight. From my conversations with true macro photographers, again, I'm a wildlife guy that just loves this other stuff. Um, F8, F11 feels pretty good. A lot of them err on the side of depth of field, so they'll go up to F16 because they want to get as much depth of field, even if it means a very small decrease in image quality or an increase in diffraction. Not a video about diffraction in macro photography, more about this lens itself. So we've got a zoom ring that's going to change the magnification not really a traditional focus ring we've got manual aperture control here a very small element on the front in my case the z mount lens has a wider uh, mounting ring on the back and there is no or there are no electronics on the back that's kind of the structure of this what most people are going to worry about or what most people are going to think about is what does this lens do how is it different now let me show you some actual images now, this is a plant called spiderwort. A flower might be an inch wide. It's purple, it's got a yellow center, really, really pretty, and it's got these really small hairs. I took this lens and I mounted it to my Z9. By the way, <laughs> this combination, I, I might get another body just to dedicate to macro photography because this is a big body. 
it's got a lot of battery power or it's high frames per second a lot of stuff that i love for wildlife i really don't need for macro photography so um it's a little overkill look at the difference in size with this big body in this relatively small lens and i'll put it up side by side with the 100 millimeter just so you can see the size difference it is really really tiny one of the nice things about it is it's very very easy to use like i said when i'm combining it with this heavier big battery z9 it feels like a little overkill i'd like to have a lighter setup just dedicated to this lens um, but i take it out in the field my field being my backyard and i look at this little spider wart with these little hairs and all of a sudden I'm blown away. I'm blown away because in my life, I've had this plant for years and I, I'm really into plants. I never noticed that these hairs were actually consisting of these tiny cells, these little fluid based cells that are stacked together and form this amazing pattern. I never saw that. Even with my macro lenses where I've taken pictures, you got hints of it, but you never saw the detail. When I use this hyper or ultra macro lens at three times, four times, I got these incredible results. I want to show you what that looks like as I zoom in. Look at these little cells and look at the detail. Now, I can tell you it's a sharp lens, but this is proof. This is what it really looks like. These are the details. Now, this is obviously, this is the cropped version of this, but you can see just how interesting things are when you stop and you look closely. And that's where this lens shines. If you're doing macro photography or you're doing uh, larger scenes, butterflies, large insects, maybe complete flowers, this lens actually will not work for that. It will not allow you to pull back and show a scene. What it will do is allow you to get incredibly close and take details that you can't see with your eye. I, I inadvertently sometimes call this a microscope. As I'm shooting pictures and I mean to say macro lens, my brain accidentally says microscope because when I look at images like this, it feels like a microscope. Now, this was done out in the field. I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges of this lens and, and actually why I say first lens, maybe an easier to use 100 millimeter could be a good answer. By the way, Leoa makes those lenses. They are manual focus. I have used them super sharp. I really do like all of their lenses. And one of the things about this company, uh, if you research the company itself, you're gonna find very, very favorable reviews of the company as it relates to macro. It's just, it's kind of their thing. Uh, I looked at this particular lens on B&H, my affiliate partner, four and a half stars. It is tough to get better than that with several reviews, not just one or two reviews. A four and a half stars is a really well-rated product. That's for this specific lens the z mount option so this specific lens uh, several reviews four and a half stars the challenges for this are around the control so the depth of field on this i have not scientifically measured it but but what i know how big i know a plant to be and where it's in focus less than half a millimeter the depth of field probably closer to a quarter and that is very shallow so if a plant or an insect moves at all everything changes. Now, in some cases like this, what I had done is just set my camera up. So I took my Z9, put it to three frames a second. I grabbed, we're going to talk about some of the accessories in just a minute, but I made sure I had a flash on there and just the cadence kind of sounds like it's just taking three pictures a second. I can hold the button down and I can move the plant or the camera and just take enough pictures that I eventually find something I like. With this one, it's pretty easy. All of those strands are there. To me, I'm not focusing on a specific thing like an eyeball. So it was pretty easy. I just took a bunch of pictures, found one that worked. I edited a little bit with some software, and here you go. Where it got a little more challenging was with insects. Went out one day, and I looked for bugs. And I thought, oh, this is going to be cool. Mostly what I found were flying insects like bees. I couldn't do it. Not while they were moving. In the field, while they were moving, this lens was just really difficult to use and it's one of the reasons I say may not be a great first lens does take some control and practice but what you get is pretty outstanding this is a I think it's called a net banded beetle and this this guy was sleeping so I got lucky took this in the field this is a live bug took it in the field just kept working it in and out until I got it again kind of consistent three or four frames a second consistent 15 20 pictures you get a couple that are in focus 
And what's neat about this, and I'll zoom in, again, this is uncropped, is the detail. Now, this is, this is not stacked. Everything in here is one frame, nothing stacked. I, I do wanna show you the depth of field. So you could see that the eyeball shows the incredible detail, both eyeballs. You get some really interesting, you, you actually see what appears to be fur. And this, this insect is an inch long, but you actually get to see it. What you lose with these small depths of field is right around here, you'll see it's out of focus. And this is why many people, when using these highly detailed images, they'll stack maybe five or 10 frames, sometimes even 50 or 100 frames. And they'll go through a progression of focal distances and they'll merge those together in software. I'm not gonna talk about that, but if you like to play around, that is really a great um, use of this lens because of that shallow depth of field. Could be a little bit of a challenge, but when you get it, you get it some really, really, really interesting stuff. I'm gonna show you some more. Again, this one in the field. What I started to find is with the wind blowing, insects moving, it was a little more difficult. So I, I started to set up this really, I'm gonna say this, this hack macro setup in my house. I am not a macro photographer. Based off of this lens, I said, you know what? Let me build a table. I'm in the process. Now I don't have it yet. I promised the company if I made a video, I would do it within 45 days. I don't have time to make the, the, the bench that I'm gonna do. But I'm gonna show you a couple accessories that I use to make this a little easier for me. Uh, let's just start with, with kind of the basic thing that you're gonna need, and that's a flash. Now this is a uh, Nikon flash. Any flash, you do not need to spend a lot of money on flashes. This is a, a pretty decent flash, it's an SB700. I'm using a diffuser made by a company called AK Diffusers. It's one that I really like, it gets very good reviews. Um, you're gonna to wanna to soften the light. You can use parchment paper, they make filaments for this. I've seen people use styrofoam, really thin styrofoam. All kinds of ways to diffuse light. You will need a flash and here's why. With this very small element stopped down to F8 or F16, it is very difficult to even see the object. If you move using natural light, if you move the ISO down, you can't see it. To move it up, you're talking 8,000, 16,000 ISO, and you need a lot of light coming in. So it's, I'm just telling you, it's really, really tough. You need a lot of light. Sometimes your shutter speed starts to get really, really, really slow. It becomes a, a huge challenge. With a flash, it's gonna mitigate all that. You can shoot at very low ISO. You can shoot at much slower shutter speeds, but you will wanna diffuse the light. So the first thing about this lens, it's gonna be, I'm not gonna say impossible, it's gonna be very difficult to shoot in natural light. So what I'm using is a flash. I've got a couple other things I wanted to show you while I was doing this, because on some of these images I've used some of this. This is a ring flash. This needs a commander, so it needs, it needs a master to, to tell it when to flash. So I've got a little, little commander here that I use. This came together. This also controls my other flash. So I can do at home, in my office, or at my new desk when I make it, I can, I can position these lights any way I want to get different looks. So that's just been kind of fun to play around. So you are gonna to wanna to flash. Those are some of the ones I use. I've actually found it helpful and you can use anything you want. If you're a dedicated macro photographer, feel free to put it in the comments. What works well for you? I'm still experimenting. I use these little clamps. So I'll lock it on one side and I'll kind of move it to where I want it on the other. I'll show you an example of that. And then I also um, never needed a slider before because I'm not a macro photographer, but I went out and bought a slider. This one, maybe a couple hundred dollars, hundred dollars. Um, and what this does is I can lock my body on here and I can just slowly move it forward and backward. It keeps it in place. I found, I found this to be extremely helpful for some of these. So I wanted to show you some of the equipment. Again, very basic, not high level stuff. But I wanted to show you how I did this because um, I think some people might find it interesting. Again, my audience, wildlife photographers, often getting these other interests out there, starting to play around a little bit more. We are connected to nature's connected to nature as photographers. Uh, and one of the things that I have found is just this macro photography. I've always enjoyed it, but as I'm dealing with these tiny flowers, and this is the example I'm gonna show you now. So I'm dealing with these tiny flowers. It has been really incredible to work with this lens. This is a, a white vervain. These flowers, I am gonna estimate ballpark a millimeter to two millimeters wide. I put it on my finger because you, I want you to appreciate the scale of this flower. This is how small it is. 
And then I use this new macro lens, a probably around four times magnification. And I was able to come up with an image that looks like this. There. Pretty neat. Now, I, I know on YouTube, sometimes it's a little more difficult to see. If you might want to turn your resolution up if you're not watching at the highest resolution. You'll see the tiny little hairs. Now, these hairs are microns wide. You can actually see them. With a traditional one-to-one -one macro, you would not get this kind of detail. And the flower, to be honest, wouldn't occupy the majority of the frame. It would be very small in frame. I've got an example of that in a minute. I found a neat little flower out in the yard the other day. And these now I'm bringing inside. Using the setup I just showed you, very simple, just a clamp to hold the flower, something to stabilize it, try to ball head, that worked. The sliding rail works much better. I can adjust it in and out just a little bit. And then some flash. I grabbed this. This is a nightshade plant. Uh, really, really neat. And what you, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, there's little pollen on the end of this. So you're able to get details, again, that you just can't get at one-to-one. -one. Pretty, pretty neat seeing that little pollen. Went outside in the yard. Uh, my swamp milkweed was blooming. I brought in one of the flowers. These flowers are not big. This is, oh, five, six millimeters wide, maybe. Look at the, look at the detail. Now, you'll see the depth of field, right? You get the middle. Each of those little, oh, plant anatomy, stamens, uh, stigma, styles, it's one of those are coming in. Some of them in focus, some of them out of focus. But look at the detail when zoomed in. This image is about five or 6,000 pixels wide, so cropped in just a little bit, but not highly cropped to get this. So the great thing about this lens on a full frame body, I don't have to crop to get these details. This could be printed at I don't know, 20 inches wide, 30 inches wide, and probably just look amazing. So really, really interesting. Now let me show you uh, the next one. This is taken with my traditional 100 millimeter macro, brought it inside, I put a little uh, object behind it, some paint, some color behind it, just to, to make it stand out. This is at minimum focus at 100 millimeters. This is the flower of a grass blade. So some grasses create little flowers, but this is called big blue stem. I'm not going to, okay, I'm not going to geek out on native plants, but it's a really cool plant. And this flower is about the size of a grain of rice. That's at 100 millimeters minimal focus. I went to 5X, so the top magnification of this Leowa uh, lens. Look at the difference. Minimum focus, but five times the magnification. Let me go back and what shows you what it looks like when we zoom in. This is the 100. And while you'll be able to see some detail in here, it will not look nearly like this one. This is not zoomed in. If I wanted to zoom it in, look what you see. It's the size of a, the whole flower is the size of a grain of rice. The opening of this would be the equivalent to a tip of a pencil. You won't get that at one-to-one. -one. You just, you can't get the same level of detail. So again, I wanted to show you this a couple times because it's a big deal. When you're dealing with this, I'll call it a specialty lens, you're doing things that you cannot do with a traditional macro lens without severe adaptation of that lens. So anyway, it's, it's really, really neat. I uh, came up with another image of that same cluster. They tend to grow in, in groups of three. I thought this was really neat. You can see all of these little openings down at the bottom of the flowers. Again, just, just each flower the size of a grain of rice. And I got one more image to show you before I kind of recap this lens and what I like and don't like. Uh, this is a wild petunia and it's got tiny little hairs on it. And the reason I'm showing you this is I want to see, I want you to see scales. At the top, I'll put my cursor here, you can probably see a little of it. You're going to see these little fuzzy white things. And I was really infatuated with those, th that fuzziness. These are called trichomes. They're, and again, it's a plant structure that's got often filled with fluid. All right, I'm geeking out. Let me get back to the images. It turned into my favorite image that I've taken with this lens. Let me tell you, before I show you the image, let me just tell you the story. I'm taking an image of these trichomes, these little fuzzy parts of the plant. And as I'm doing it, I've got my little, got my little clamp here. I'm all excited, a new lens. I've, I've mounted it. I've got that little slider in place. And I'm just moving the plant a little bit to, to see what it looks like. And all of a sudden, something moves in front of the, the lens, this little brown thing. And there was something living on this, and it was an ant. It's called a winter ant. And this is not typical of your normal ants. Some ants can be, you know, millimeters long. This one is three millimeters. It is a tiny ant, almost hard to see with your eye. Three millimeters long, 
less than a millimeter wide. And now the game was on because what I wanted to do is take a picture of that ant. It took about 30 or 40 frames. I got three frames where the head was in focus. Again, it is not easy to use. I don't have autofocus. Autofocus probably wouldn't do me any good. Here's what I did. Locked the camera in place, took this side of this little flexible piece, and I would just move the leaf back and forth, and it was moving. This is a moving insect. This is why it was so cool. Let me show you what it turned into. That insect was moving when I took this picture. So it was not easy to do. Those are the little trichomes, those little hairs. You can't see the detail with your naked eye. One-to-one, -one, I've taken these ants one-to-one. -one. It does not look like this. This was about three-to-one magnification. And let me just show you a little more detail of what that looked like when I got a little closer. You can see, you can see the individual features of the eye. I told you the depth of field is shallow. If we assume that this insect is about a millimeter wide, I would predict it's less than a millimeter wide. I would predict the depth of field to be about a quarter of a millimeter, meaning I can't even get the whole length or the width of this bug. Say it's half a millimeter. I can't even get it all in focus. My guess is we measure this in microns. It's about 250 microns or a quarter of a millimeter is the depth of field. That depth of field gets smaller as you increase the magnification. So you can see some real challenges with this. So is this lens for everybody? Let me just kind of recap. I'll tell you the pros and cons, what not to expect from this lens, but how to really enjoy this. When compared to a traditional macro lens, especially if you're used to using like I am, you know, sometimes I'll put the autofocus on. A lot of macro photographers don't believe in autofocus, but I'm a wildlife photographer. I've, I've grown used to autofocus. This lens doesn't have it. So it can, be, it can be a challenge. What you will not do is, is step back and take portraits. What you will not do is step back and take large butterfly pictures or big flower pictures. You won't get anything scenic that way. You're going to deal with detail. So this lens is probably not for the person that is interested in those other things. If you want to take larger scale, and I say macro, but again, with macro, we can always move back a little if we don't like it, depending on the lens. If that's what you want to do, maybe this isn't the best first lens for you. I, I did not look at this, and the review for this isn't geared at somebody saying, this is the best first lens you should buy. Now, if you do detailed work, if you're doing, I, I've seen people take pictures of coins and you're taking the edges of it. Maybe you're not a, a nature photographer. You may, this could be your first lens. If you're looking for detail, I'm telling you, Give this one a serious consideration just for detail. But if you've got that first lens and you're looking to play, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a client out. We were doing wildlife photography. She's a, a wildlife client. And I said, bring your diffuser. I want to show you this lens. We took some pictures. We grabbed a flower. We actually put it on my Jeep, the hood of my Jeep. And we took pictures of it just like that. They're not on my camera. They're on hers. She sent me the pictures. They're so cool. They're just... They're just things you can't see with your eye. Really, really, really impressive. And we took it freehand with a flower resting on a car. So it can be done, but it's not forgiving. So you, you've got to have some patience. It takes a little bit of practice, but when you get it, let me just show you again. When you get it, this is not something I can do with any other lens that I own. Can't do it with a wildlife lens for sure. Can't even do it with my macro lens the way I have it set up anyway. Um, and the price is just about right. You know, $400, maybe there's a discount code at the bottom, check that out. But at $400, you're not, you're not necessarily breaking the bank. For a well-built lens, again, aluminum construction, it feels like a rock. It's not super heavy, but it's very, very well-built. So the, the pros on this are really just the ability to get detail you can't get, the build quality is sensational, reputable company, good reviews on B&H, um, it's just, it's just really, really solid for what it does, the cons. There's no electronic information going back and forth. Everything is manual, including the aperture adjustment. So you can't change aperture on your camera body. You're actually going to change it on the lens. And I will tell you, that's not a big deal at all to me. Um, if, you're not using, if you're not used to using these lens, and I'm not going to put this as a con, but you will need a, a flash most likely and a diffuser. 
So just know that, but you're probably gonna need that for any macro photography, not specifically for this lens. This lens is a, is a little more challenging when it comes to available light. And you'll find that out if you ever play around with one of these. So uh, that's what I got for you today. I tried to give you some detail on this. I, my channel is always practical. So I like to show images. I like to tell you my thoughts. I like to, to kind of give you that, that real life experience. What I don't like to do is just bombard you with stats that at the end of the day, for a lot of people don't really matter. What matters is, does it work and does it do the job it's supposed to do in 100%. This lens did exactly what I wanted it to do, maybe even a little bit more. It might have exceeded my expectations. And more importantly for me, it added a dimension to my photography that I, I was just really impressed with. I told you I've been geeking out on this for weeks. I have really, really enjoyed using this. So I want to thank uh, Leowa for sending me the lens. Down at the bottom, there'll be some links. Make sure you click those links. Check for the discount code because I think that could also save you some money. Um, if it's still available, again, retail right around $400. It's going to save you a little bit of money and uh, it could be a lot of fun for you. So anyway, hope you appreciate the review. Down in the comments, have you used an ultra macro like this? I know there are ways to adapt regular macro lenses. Have you used this lens or one like it? What are your thoughts? Are you curious? Did this detail, did this ultra macro lens detail appeal to you? And are you curious about this one? If you have questions that I can answer, again, I, I always make the point, this is not my specialty. I'm approaching this from the view as somebody who actually doesn't do this a lot, but really, really enjoys doing it and is 100% is going to do this more. But if you've got some experience you'd like to share down in the comments, feel free. People use those comments, they, they browse through them, and sometimes they glean some information. So I like to use this channel to share some information as well. Thanks for your support on this video. Thanks for your support on the entire channel. I gotta tell you, I just really appreciate the views and comments. I read them all, so thank you so much for that. Uh, if you're not subscribed, there's a subscribe button down there. Make sure you click that. And as always, I hope we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together.